Welcome to Startup Grind Chilliwack. So Startup Grind is a global movement. There are now over 600 chapters. I first learned about it a couple years ago and it's really grown within the last year from about 300 to 600 and really in 170 different countries. It originated in Silicon Valley and it's really this amazing network of local communities that all focus up into the big startup grind. It's about three things. We make friends, we give first, and we help others. It's not about taking and, and who can we get from, it's about how can we build a local startup community, and it's starting to happen in the Upper Fraser Valley. We've had three wonderful sponsors throughout the year, the Chilliwack Economic Partners Corporation, Accelerator, and University of the Fraser Valley. Let's hear it for our sponsors. They keep that wine flowing and the ticket price is low. Our partners, these are the folks that are putting it on every month, and that's Cowork Chilliwack, Currency Marketing, Wisebox, and Around Chilliwack. Let's hear it for our partners. <laughs> and if you are hashtagging anything, you start up Grind and put it on Twitter and so forth, and that's part of the overall Startup Grind community. And do follow that hashtag. It's, it's really interesting, and there's lots of these independent groups going on. Our guest today is Dan Sawatsky, and Dan is the founder of the Imagination Corporation. So everybody on your feet, and let's give Dan a huge startup grind Chilliwack welcome. Yeah! So Dan said, uh, I watched some of your other intros, and please don't do that for me. <laughs> Thank so you I changed it up. I gave, you got a standing ovation. Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> well, thank you so much for taking time to, to come to this and share your story. It's pretty amazing. Thank you. I'm interested. What is your title? Uh, a title is about as hard as explaining what I do. Yeah. It's, um, I don't have a title. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll sweep the floor, mm -hmm. and uh, I get to design, and we get sales. Uh, do just about everything. So chief janitor and creative officer. Um, yeah, I'm not even a full owner anymore, so it's, okay. it's, things have changed. Well, fair enough. Well, the first photo I've got to show you is, is some of your artistic beginnings, and this you submitted as uh, evidence piece number one. Piece number one. Uh, I, that was my first piece of art, and uh, I got rewarded for it, as you can imagine. <laughs> and my mother said it was awesome, and she cannot tell a lie, so... True. That's... <laughs> so you were born in Vancouver, I understand. Born in Vancouver, raised in Castlegar, in a little town called Blueberry Creek, which is about as small as you can go. So from the metropolitan to the tiny, how did that happen? Uh, work. My dad got a job at the pulp mill in Castlegar, okay. and that meant we, we would move to the country. Wow. This was your first, or one of your first, paying gigs as a sign-slash-artist. Um, tell me about that. Well, I knew I was going to be an artist from the time I could hold a crayon, that, that first little drawing. Uh, I knew that, we, I had no idea what an artist did. Uh, we were from a small town, in those days there was no internet, no anything. And uh, my brother won a contest in school, uh, painting uh, a tribute to Nancy Green, which was uh, back in the 60s, was a uh, gold medalist in skiing. Yeah, and in Castlegar Trail area, she would have been like... Yeah, it was huge. huge. And uh, he won a prize of 15 bucks. Hmm. And a little light went on my head is, is a window painting is worth $15. So your brother is older and he was... One year and 10 days. We're fiercely competitive. Got even it. to this day. Yeah, I Although got Although he has admitted that I've won. Okay. So, so, but don't tell him I didn't really win. Because okay. he, he, he uh, moved to a town in Ontario and uh, uh, everywhere he went, people asked if he, I was related or he was related to Dan Swatsky. And he said, yeah, he's my brother. He had to admit that. Fair uh, enough. A year later, I Googled it, and it turns out there was an accountant in his town named Dan Swatsky. So they weren't asking about me. <laughs> but, but I won. <laughs> Fair enough. So don't tell him that. Well, you also, I recall a story that you once told about someone thinking you had overcharged them? Or well, ba Back when I was, I mean, I was 14 years old painting windows. Um, I, the first winter... It's a very short season. In those days, you didn't do Christmas till after December, so you had two weeks to get all your windows up. And I was making good money, and uh, I would go in with a book and sell my window previously, and, and if you bought that window as a business, then I would write your name on it, and no one else was allowed to buy that design. Okay. So, and, and agreed to price, depending on size, how hmm. long. So I painted a window, and I was 
the, the deal was I was to get $50. And I, I did it in a little over an hour because I was very fast. And uh, the store manager came and, and he was pleased. He liked the window, but he says, I'm not paying you $50. Well, first he asked me who owned the company because I, I guess he wanted to know he was, who he was tangling with. And I said, me. And he couldn't get over a 14-year-old kid would charge 50 bucks for an hour's work. And these Be are $1960. Minimum or... wage was a dollar an hour. Okay, yeah, so, that's pretty so, good money. So he offered to pay me 25 and so I asked him for a bucket of water and a rag and I threatened to take half the window off. <laughs> and give it and we stood there and stared each other's eyes and that was the moment of truth. And he said, "You know, if you do that, you'll get paid nothing." And I said, "Well, yeah, but you won't have anything either." Hmm. And uh he blinked first and he gave me my 50 bucks. Well, that that goes back to the idea of like the artist's time, right? You, you put in time to become an expert. Yeah, I had to explain to him that, that he wasn't paying by the hour. He was paying, you know, he agreed to a price. Uh, it was good value for $50 for a Christmas window. That was mm -hmm. a great price. Uh, and how long it took me was in his benefit, not mine. Hmm. And uh, he, he bought off on it. So if you think back to elementary school, junior high... I bet you just love the rows of desks and just being told that you need to write on the lines. And I didn't fit in very good. No. And uh, in those days, uh, my parents informed me that only dummies took shop courses. So I took, I graduated academic, uh, you know, science and math. Mm -hmm. uh, and I wish I would have taken shop courses. Mm -hmm. But the flip side is my son, I encouraged him to take shop courses. And then he wanted to be a, a math teacher, and he had to go back and get all those courses that he missed. So <laughs> there is no right answer. There is no right answer, yeah, for sure. So this really led to making a living an artist from the get-go. So you've essentially been self-employed. 51 years. Yeah, and, but you did take a job, uh, I understand, when you met your, your soon-to-be wife. I met Janice. Uh, I was 16, and, and she, she, or I, maybe I was 17, and she was 16. Uh, we dated her for a couple of weeks, and I asked her to marry me, and she said no. So I'm a patient guy. We went out for a couple of weeks more, and I asked her again, and she said no. And it went on. Eventually, she said yes. But her, account, her family is an accounting family, and if accounting families say you work hard, you get good education, you get a good job, and you work here 35 years, you put your money away, and then you retire. Well, I, I, so I went to work at Safeway. It was the best-paying job around, hmm. uh, and it just about killed me. And so you put on the union hat and, and did your time? Uh, I wasn't very good at that. Yeah. But, but I worked hard. And about three years in, I decided, that I made a, went to my family and I said, look, it, I'm making good money. I have good, good benefits. I have good you know, pension. If I can do the same on my own, then I'm going to jump. And they went, sure, because what was the chances of that? Hmm. So then I switched to night shift and I pretended I was full time. And I worked my tail off for four years until I could make that deal. So we're a couple stories in and, and both are totally about negotiation. Absolutely. <laughs> negotiation is a very valuable skill. No kidding. <laughs> hmm. As you got into your 20s, you started to do... I was pen and ink drawings. Yeah. I was doing commercial work. I, was, I would wear a three-piece suit and go and knock on the corporations to do corporate art. Hmm. Uh, I was doing logo design, all that. Plus, I had my work in 40 galleries okay. doing limited edition prints. And those prints, are st they're still hanging around. I still bump into people all the time. So, oh, I got your stuff. It's still hanging on my wall. So it's kind of hmm. cool. So Dan Sawatsky, artist doing limited edition. And I understand that by this point, you were married. And it was, the, it was the corporation of, of Dan and... And yeah, my wife and I were partners right from the get-go. And Janice's job was to corral the artist and, and monetize what you were doing in some and way? And make the money stretch till next time I... Yeah. She would send me out and say, don't come home till you make a thousand bucks because the mortgage was due. Okay. And so I would go to Vancouver and hit all my galleries up and uh, I always made it. Hmm. And you were doing your own framing and We had and a everything. frame shop in the like, basement. We had, uh, we'd do art shows in a house. It was, we built... That was in Abbotsford. So, wow. And built a gallery in the house. And, and looking back at your career, it's always been these phases. Okay, I'm going to do this thing for five, ten years. And, I, and I, don't, I promise Janice I'm going to do it forever. Okay. But I have about a five or ten year attention span where I've sort of been there, done that, um, time to turn a page. Mm -hmm. And I, I've driven her crazy. I mean, thank goodness. She's still with me after 45 years. She's a good lady. So you went from pen and ink drawings and then to limited edition prints to then going... Huge scale. How did that happen to jump into murals? I did an art show, and, and a fellow from Shimanis, a guy named Carl Schutz, um, he got this brainwave to do murals, historical murals, telling the town's history 
uh, on the walls. Hmm. And he came to an art show that I did at, it was at Nat Bailey Stadium, one of the worst art shows I ever did. Uh, but you never know what's going to come out of it. And so he came to my table and he said, can you paint a mural? And I said, absolutely. Hmm. Uh, never paint a mural, but that's, that's a small point. Right. Um, <laughs> and so I, was inv- I went to Shimanus. I did my first mural, and I fell in love with the town, and I said, let's, let's move there. Hmm. And, and so that describe was, how your technique of doing a mural. Did you mock it up small and then project yeah, you, it on the wall? Yeah, you do a wall? small drawing, okay. and you project it on the wall. You cheat like crazy. Okay. Um, but I don't think it's cheating because you, yeah. you did the original drawing. Mm-hmm. It's just a way of getting it up there. Mm-hmm. Or some people grit it and, and right. paint. What, go, go for it. Yeah. Uh, I'm trying to make a living. So uh, we moved to Shimanus eventually. And people came to Shimanus as I knew they would. There was up to 400,000 people a year coming there from all over the world. Hmm. And they want to take that home. How many folks have seen the murals in Shimanus? Quite a few. Good How many you. knew that one person did a lot of them? I did seven there. So, yeah. yeah. And overall, I think you did well over 100 murals in 125, your... 125, yeah. In, in this career. Right? In that career, yeah. yeah. And what span of time was that? Over 10 years. I was doing up to 14 a year. Hmm. And all over North America. All over North America. Did, and even one in the embassy in Japan. Wow. So it was a temporary one. But and it, this was probably pre-internet. Um, pre-internet. And how were you getting the word out that, that I'm, would, I'm a mural painter? It's... It, no matter what world you're in, it's a small world, and yeah. people network. And so someone from, from a community would hear about Shimanus, come there, a lot of uh, people who just love their town, and, and they, the first question, who did them? And uh, I knew everybody in town, it's a small town, mm-hmm. and so they'd say, well, that guy over there. So I, I lived, uh, purposely lived downtown, and we'd get a knock on the door, and I'd say, well, let me, let me take you for a tour, hmm. and, and build up the confidence, uh, and then it's, okay, I'll make you a deal. Just, I'll come to your town. Uh, I'll promote the murals with you. Uh, we'll do a limited edition print, which I already had that technology down plat. Okay. And then uh, we'll, we'll help you fundraise, and then you pay me the money to paint the mural. Okay, interesting. So it was... So this, this limited edition would be done beforehand, and, and you would come in and, yep. and fundraise. Yeah, so they're splitting the cost and creating a great piece of art for their community. Yeah, they'd pay me for the print, and then when mm-hmm. they sold enough prints to finance the mural, they'd bring me back. Okay. And so you would load up the trailer and head down? or We traveled you... as a family. We, we'd, we had a little uh, 19-foot trailer and a little jimmy, and we'd travel every summer. We'd go out and paint murals. Wow. It was, it was a great, the kids grew up on the road. Uh, you know, so time frame in your life, was this like your 30s or? Yeah, I painted the mural in Shimanus when I was 28, so okay. it was in my, through my 30s. Hmm. So you, at this point, were always selling it to old skeptical guys that were wondering why was this costing so much and uh, no, or how you got beyond that? No, I think, I believe that as, as people we can rise to the top of our game and I was definitely at the top of my game in terms of what I was asking. Mm-hmm. You know, I was asking a lot, but I also provide a way to, to make it possible. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I could public speak. We could, you know, jazz up the town. It, would, it was fun. Cool. Well, the next phase is somehow going from living on a ladder, gridding out these, these large-scale things, to theme signs and environments, which has really been the thread up until now. Signs have gone through my entire career. I've always yeah. done signs. In Shemanus, I did hundreds of signs did building design and stuff. Hmm. And I've always maintained that uh, a sign, my definition of sign is not normal. I, I see a sign as anything that draws attention to a customer's product, service, or business. And the more different it is from normal, the more effective it can be, as long hmm. as it fits within what's allowed. So you must have bristled when the first Gerber vinyl cutters came out and Helvetica doesn't, letters, stickers doesn't were coming Doesn't matter to me in the least. Okay. I don't do vinyl. No, I know, but, but when you saw that kind of the proliferation of the uh, sameness... No, there's a certain... I'm, I'm looking for 1% of the market. Right. And that 1% will be there no matter what. The people who want something different, who want to stand out from their crowd, stand out from their neighbors, mm-hmm. uh, and, and are, un- understand that that's not an inexpensive way to go, hmm. but an inexpensive or a, a very expensive sign is not uh, a bad thing if it pays its own way. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like when I did murals. I was higher priced than a lot of people, but because I, I, I could justify it yeah. and, and, and provide a way to pay for it, it was a bargain. Mm-hmm. And you mentioned your brother, and I think he played a role in your shift to theme signs, in yeah, a my, sense? Yeah, my brother and I have always tagged teams. He worked at Safeway. I worked at Safeway. I was the first guy to quit. You know, then he quit. Then I was doing murals. He went into murals. 
Uh, on one of his mural tour, he saw uh, them building a mini golf. He was doing a mural in a theme park or something, and he saw a mini golf and went, I can do that. So mm. when you build a mini golf, it, it's a complex thing. You have to, there's the groundwork, there's the contractors, there's, the, you know, all that stuff, the carpets and the electrical, and, and then there's the theme part. Right. And it was hard to do all of it because he didn't like to employ a lot of people. So he would bring me on as a contractor to do, and I'd take the fun part. Absolutely. How's your putting? Horrible. Horrible? Horrible. I have no depth perception. <laughs> okay. I'm not good at that. I love the game. Yeah. But uh, at Giga Ridge, when we owned that, I could do very well there. Yeah. But, but I knew it. I built Practice, it. right? Yeah. You knew the, the, the bends and the curls and yeah, the... Well, yeah, yeah, for sure. There was a trick shot. And this is you and... I want to play this. This is a short video that kind of captures the essence of what you're doing now, even though this jumps into the future. But I think it'll... Because when I put on my emails to you guys that it's he does signs in themed environments. It doesn't totally communicate the imagination, the creativity. I can't explain what I know. Doing. So this will do a good job. So many people in life don't do what they love. I set out very early in my life to, to do something that I absolutely love to do. We're, we're a family company and uh, we build what we love all day long. That's what we do here. We, we make places. We're making places that are not just uh, fun to go to, but the, that are really special. Places that create memories for people. And that's really something magical. Uh, when we're building something, we always say that if people aren't stopping and taking pictures of what we're doing before we're finished, we haven't done our jobs right. Yeah, each project we do, we have what we call an entrance portal, and, and it's a, a themed place where, as you walk in, everything about that place is special. They feel it through the soles of their feet, they hear it in the sounds, uh, the music, uh, they smell the flowers, the landscaping, everything transports them to this make-believe world that we've created. Our company is called Sawatsky's Imagination Corporation. And my definition of that is Swatsky's, obviously we're a family company. Imagination, think of it. And then the corporation is a group of people doing that. It's a, it's a small family company that builds pure magic. So that succinctly sums up what you're doing. It's amazing. Um, when you think, I realized when you were uh, playing with your or drawing with your pen. The one of the things we skipped over was that one of the things, and perhaps this was fitting into conforming, but you were thinking of being a drafts person or an architect. I seriously considered it when I, w I was desperate to get out of Safeway and I wanted to do something creative. An architect was always sort of in the back of my mind. And I actually attended one year of BCIT. Hmm. Uh, and they I would quickly, have made you use a T-square and that's triangles. Why I, and I, that, sometimes you go down a path and you realize that's the wrong path. Yeah. But, but that's a valuable lesson that I, I absolutely do not regret that. Hmm. Um, and I learned stuff, too, about architecture, which I still use. Mm -hmm. But I discovered the, the technical pen, which I mm. used in my pen and ink drawings. Yeah, because so. that's a piece in architecture, especially back then. It was a very free-form, yep. flowing conceptual drawings and early now, on. Now it's digital, it's cool. Yeah. Hmm. You went from figuring out how to do little mini golfs to working at West Edmonton Mall. Yeah, like, one time the largest entertainment uh, complex in the world. Mm -hmm. And we were invited, uh, they had a conflict with, with Disney over the name and they changed it to Galaxyland from Fantasyland. Okay. And, and as part of that whatever settlement they did, they had five years to do it. So they were looking for a small company that would come in and our mandate was to change this five acre indoor park, totally change it in five years. And they added one twist is you can't shut down a ride for more than one day. And so we said, yeah, we can do that. Wow. Again, way over my head, but uh, we did it. And at this point, you're talking we. Was it just you, or you'd grown a small team by this point? It was place? we, my son, Peter. Mm -hmm. He was with us at that point, uh, my daughter, Beck. And I, had, I brought two, two guys from BC to Alberta, and then we, our team expanded through that time as you know, they started small to, so we could prove that we could do what we could do. Mm -hmm. And then 
it got bigger and bigger and bigger. But amazingly, that whole job, we were working uh, without, a, without a contract uh, that didn't go more than 30 days. Wow. And two, that must have been a monster client, like representing more than 50% of your income probably? Another life lesson. Yeah. Uh, they were all of our income for, okay. for quite a number of years. And the, the danger of that, any entrepreneur, is, is when you get into that kind of situation, your client owns you. Right. Um, and, and they treat us well, but boy, did it end fast when, when it ended. Wow. And I guess while you were doing that, you were also doing stuff for Mall of America, which was part of that same company? That was company. a little later. A little uh, later, we did okay. That. But as we saw the, the, the job drawing close, we went to um, quite a number of companies. You know, we, we were doing three jobs in three cities at once. We were up to 22 people looking at going to 100 hmm. and spinning things out. Wow. I'm curious about your transition from two-dimensional art to three-dimensional sculpture and working with like fiberglass infused cement and other things. How did you figure that out? Trial and error. Yeah. I mean, even when I goes right back to when I was 15, 16 years old owning a sign shop. Uh, you know, we would buy a sheet of MDO and paint it. Hmm. And most, most sign makers, they buy a four by eight sheet and that's the size of a sign and they'll cut it down to fit. But everything runs through the table saw, everything's square. Right. Where we would, you know, if I can cut something out with a jigsaw, take my scraps and laminate it up to become layers, hmm. I can charge extra for that. My material costs have not increased mm -hmm. and it separates me from everybody else. So it's a matter of thinking differently. Right? And that goes right back to I was 16 years old. And tell me about the serendipitous pause on Splash Mountain. We were, oh, we were asked to do a job in, in Shimanas, a, a big entrance arch, uh, and it was the first fiberglass reinforced concrete. I knew what it was, but that's all I knew. Hmm. And so we were asked to do this huge, it was about 100 feet wide and six, or 30, 35 feet tall or something like that. And I said, absolutely. And he said, you got 30 days to do it, we're waiting for a structure. And the 30 days didn't start for a couple of weeks. So there's only one thing I could do, and that's go to Disneyland. Hmm. Um, and hoping I could find the answers there. And, and Splash Mountain had just opened, and we're chugging up the hill. And wouldn't know that the ride stopped just before we went over the top. And I was praying that it would stay broken. Everyone else in the ride was praying <laughs> that it would go again. Um, and as luck would have it... Um, it was broken, so they had to walk us out. And so I was making sure I was the last guy to get out of the car, and my camera kept going off all the way out the ride. <laughs> and I recorded everything I need to. I learned more in those five minutes than I've ever learned since. Hmm. Um, and my wife jokingly, she says, what did you throw? But I, I didn't throw anything. It, it, was, it was pure coincidence. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> for sure. And this, just the joy in these photographs that you sent, I mean, this is your happy place, right? Well, I mean, it, you think about the ridiculousness of it. I get to do three-dimensional cartoons mm -hmm. and sell them worldwide. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. But it shows how anything is possible if you put your mind to it. I mean, if, if you can make your living doing that, everything else is pretty, pretty easy, I think. I mean, hmm. I know a lot of artists who starve because they, they can't put that together. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I was blessed with, with a wife, uh, Janice, who is very good at books and, and, and a very um, hard partner in terms of I have to sell stuff to her. I have to, you know, I, I get a, this brilliant idea to, to buy a, a piece of equipment and she'll, her first answer is, are you kidding me? No. And then it's, um, well, show me. And then it's maybe, and then it's prove it. And, and at that point, it's a done deal. So, <laughs> but, but she makes me not just run out and buy something, but instead mm -hmm. prove the business case. And during all of this time, like when you were doing West Edmonton Mall, did, they, did you have a workshop at the mall, or were you kind of working out of trailers? Or they would set us up in a store that was vacant. Okay. And so we were always moving, right. and hopefully close to our job. But sometimes we were a mile from where our shop was. Wow. And we'd roll these carts through the, through the mall. And, and we had rules. We weren't allowed to run. Mm -hmm. And we weren't allowed to jump over small kids, and there was a bunch of other rules. So what? <laughs> <laughs> so after all of this time, you started to put down roots. And yeah, we 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 came out of West Hampton Mall. Mm -hmm. We we'd done a great business for you know three wonderful years of books that the bank would basically borrow me whatever I needed for any crazy project I can imagine. And so it was a magic window 
because they don't look forward. They don't ask you what you got coming. They, they said, show us three years. Mm-hmm. And so I had three great years. So we had this idea of, of building Giggle Rich. Hmm. And, and so we, um, I was a bit frustrated by people who would go 70, 80% of the way. But nobody would, would do it my way, totally. Mm-hmm. And so Giga Ridge made perfect sense to me for a couple of reasons. One was it was a good business. I, I was firmly, adamantly believed that, and Janice did too. And secondly is I wanted to build a showcase that took us to world class. Hmm. And so that, that was sort of, and it did both of those with incredibly... I think that's you know, a, a constant arc for many commercial artists is you, you end up doing client work and, and kind of agreeing to things that don't necessarily reach your vision, but then slowly but surely you build up confidence to the point where, screw the client, I'm going to do my own thing. Is that sort of the arc? You have to be, believe in yourself and, yeah. and um, trust yourself that you're doing the right thing. Mm-hmm. That you, most artists, they have that little lingering self-doubt. Well, if they don't buy this, I can't make this month's rent. Mm-hmm. And therefore, they will take less just to get anything. Right. Where we've not taken... Uh, I've said no to a lot of stuff that drove my wife crazy with worry because, you know, <laughs> but I t- trust me, this is going to work. So Giggle Ridge, it's on leased land, and from the outset, you're watching this thing go up, and you're, people are thinking, boy, is he over-investing in this thing. And Everybody told me I was crazy, yeah. and we had to do it in 100 days. Wow. And we did it. Hmm. Um, 100 but, days so you can meet the season to get some yeah, revenue going, essentially? Yeah, and, and 100, I would try to do it in 80 days, but we did it in 100 days, which opened us in July, hmm. which was too late, but you did what you did. Right. But, but it was world class. It was one of the best mini golfs in the world. And you ran that as a family business for... 14 years. 14 years. And an, another, again, lesson is, is be careful what you wish for, because that was a business that took every summer away from us. Hmm. Uh, and it split my attention span. I had to worry about Giga Ridge, and I had to. Uh, I still wanted to create. It's more fun to create than to run. Mm-hmm. And then you found some property in Yarrow that you fell in love with. You, I believe. F- yes, we found, you f- fell in love with Yarrow, and and uh, it, it's the ideal thing. I get to live in a small town, population fifteen hundred. I can walk to get pizza and gas and insurance and just about everything there. Mm-hmm. Uh, and yet the farmer's fields are adjoining my property. And so you sold Giggle Ridge to the owner of the water park, water park. Yep. and he said, go crazy. We're going to invest more money, you acquired a bit he more land. He had deep pockets. We, we had tried to expand Giggle Ridge. Mm. Uh, it was beyond our, our pay grade. Yep. He had deep pockets, and he trusted us to, to fulfill his vision and our vision. And I pr- made him a promise. I said, I gave him a price, and I basically said, I will build this as if it was my own. Hmm. And we put in far more. And he was very generous to us at the end. Hmm. Um, but he's a good businessman. How many of you have seen what is now Cultus Lake Amusement Park? Yeah. Quite a few of you. This is a terrific overview video. I think it was for a, a, an award entry, but I'm going to play that and get a real feel for just how complex this, this project is. Yeah. When I think of going from limited edition prints to this, it's just well, he wanted a chasm. he wanted yeah seven attractions on that property, and we yeah. managed to fit fourteen wow. by playing with right envelopes and hmm. really and yet it doesn't feel crowded. It's a great yeah. little park. I can't believe it's here. Okay, I want to give you a tour of one of the most exciting theme parks in the entire world on a small scale. Fifteen years ago, we built Giga Ridge Adventure Golf, a, an attraction we were exceptionally proud of, and we operated it for 15 years, and then we sold it. And the new owners were determined to take this wonderful little park and expand it into a amusement park and carry that same theme throughout. And we were going to expand this flat level land into something magical and enchanting. The site was dead flat, but what was magical about it was there was literally a forest surrounding it, which screened it from the outside world. 
And so we took this flat land and we dug down into it and we built mountains onto it to create something totally different than from what we started. The signs, of course, couldn't be ordinary. And each sign tells of the, the critter that owns it or operates it and tells the story in a magical way. A good example of the signs is, is in the Bucky's Pond area where the bumper boats are. If you look close and guests do, um, they'll see that he's gnawed through the posts that support the structure overhead and he's actually gnawed through his own sign which leans precariously over the pond. What makes this park so different from every other one is because we had such a small footprint to work with, we've actually over, overlapped the ride envelopes and stacked the rides one on top of another. The queues wind in and around. The Wilderness Park is a quiet, almost oasis for younger kids and families. I guess young kids and those still young at heart. There are all kinds of adventure awaits there. There's even 130 feet of caves hidden underneath the walkway. Guests who enter the park have no idea there's kids playing underneath them. Uh, this park is tight in every respect, and yet it feels anything but that. Every square inch of the park is themed and careful attention was paid to every single detail. Each ride has specific icons uh, molded into the fences and, and theming that suits that particular ride. The project was a collaboration between the owners and his team and Swatsky's Imagination Corporation. It took a great deal of cooperation and teamwork to pull it off. As you enter the park, every sense you, you have is, is engaged. The ground feels different as you walk on it. Your ears pick up the sounds of the, of the attractions, of the music, of the, the waterfalls, everything. Your eyes take in the flowers, the ambiance, um, everything is different. It's a total experience. And, th and this is what we tried to create in a huge way. Nothing about Cultus Lake Adventure Park is ordinary. Everything is magical. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Yeah. So those, uh, those videos are done by InMist, a local company, yeah. too. They do, do a great job. For sure. So you're dealing with, like, engineering must be a huge component. Did you find an engineering firm that you work really well with, or how does that... We've trained a good engineer. Okay. So <laughs> basically what we do, I mean, an engineer doesn't understand what we want. I mean, typically an engineer wants to build a structure, and then we have to add to it where we want to um, design something and then fit our structure to go into it. Hmm. So most often we will design with uh, sticks or pencil rod or something mm -hmm. and say, here's what we want to build and here's where we, we think the bracing should go. And then he will do his math and, and say, yeah, you're right, or we have to do a little tweaking and stuff. So, hmm. Wow, that's incredible. But, but they love it because it's, it's different than the normal beams and posts and things. Hmm. So this phase transitioning away from Giggle Ridge to now working back on this project, but then the dream of creating your own workshop I think you'd had for many, many years. And so this is where you work out of now. We, right from the start, we've always been home-based. That family is so critical to me. I want to look out of the window in my studio and see my kids playing when they were younger, now my grandkids. And so that was key. Uh, I want a workspace where we have room, and you know we thought we built this massive workshop, which turned out to be not true. Hmm. Especially we've added crazy equipment and stuff, but um, it will make it do. Hmm. And but it's made <laughs> us smart because everything we build is on wheels during mm -hmm. a construction phase. So 
our shop gets rearranged twice a week. Mm -hmm. And I also, I imagine it's got some constraints, right? The size of your team and your, yep. what you can take on. And, but and that fits in our magic number of seven employees. Right. And, and that keeps my head on straight. Yep. It means I don't have to do every task. Uh, but, you know, it, it works. Yeah, I think that's the perfect size of company. My company grew to 15 people, and I said, ah, and shrunk it back <laughs> down, right? You've got to be careful what you wish for. I mean, yeah. if you want to be that and mm -hmm. have 1,000 employees, go for it. Mm -hmm. um, but chances are you're not going to be doing what you start out doing. You're yeah, be your doing role has to change. a very right? different job. Yeah, and if you're as consciously selective about your, what you're doing, and, and you are. Yeah, I mean, today yeah. I drew, I designed. <laughs> uh, I drove the forklift and loaded some stuff. I, you know, ran the CNC router. Yeah, I welded a little bit, um, I sculpted a little bit. I mean, that's a perfect day for me. Hmm. And, and I, you know, I mean, our team is so good, I just say, you know, go do that. Hmm. That's awesome. So when you're now looking at projects, I love your six-question test, and I'm going to walk you through these, and you explain what these mean to you and your company. Okay, we've actually boarded down to five now. Okay. But, but we'll, let's go with the six. Yeah, let's, let's see which one of these is outdated. It, so number one, does it excite us? Is, is this going to keep me up at night? Is this, uh, is this going to make me, when I'm supposed to be watching a movie with my wife, do I sneak up my sketchbook and start sketching? Uh, is it going to keep me awake at night, thinking, solving these complex problems that we create? Um, is it going to be, is it going to, is going to excite my team? Are they going to say, "Oh, cool"? You mm -hmm. know, it, it's a motivator. So, so this is a discussion with your whole team when, it, when, when a we interview a client, and, opportunity and they, comes your way. They present us with an opportunity, and then we say, "We'll get back to you." We don't say yes then. Right. And then we go back. Generally, it's Peter and myself and Beck, mm -hmm. and sometimes some of our staff who are great, and say, "You know, what do you think of this one?" Hmm. So, and if it's exciting, okay, they've passed the first of six um, critical steps. Got it. And we need five yeses, or six yeses. Right. We, if there's a no, it's gone. Number two, will it be fun? Will it be fun? I mean, I believe in having fun. Does that make me laugh? Is it, is it the stupidest thing we've ever done? Hmm. Um, you know, that's what, that's, we, want it, we want that. And it's, it was, oh yeah, that's fine, you're successful, now you can do that. No, we've done this from the start. I didn't quite have it down this tight, it, mm -hmm. but, it, you know, I mean, people, when we're, you know, you get a bad, a, a bit of a strip where you're a bit lean, right? and some would drive up the driveway, and Janice saw them going by the house because their shop's at the back, Yeah, and they'd be there for 20 minutes, and they'd leave, and, and my phone would ring, and uh, not our customer. Hmm. She'd say, what do you mean not our customer? They, they'll buy something. It's not my customer, because the well, last thing I would do is get busy at something, right. and then have to turn down a good one. So we asked, we're, and we're adamant about those questions. Hmm. Number three, will it build our reputation? Yeah, is it good for me? Is it going to raise my bar? Is it going to, is this going to make people want us more? Is it, because every project has to raise the bar. Mm -hmm. We won't go back in yesterday's groove. Mm -hmm. it, it creates some headaches for us, and it challenges. But I think as human beings, we need to be challenged, not doing the same job day after day. So every job has to do that. Number four, do we have creative control? Does the customer trust us? Um, we're, we're an award-winning company. We've got shelves of awards, which awards won't buy you a cup of coffee, but it does, it's nice to be mm -hmm. recognized by your peers. But does, you know, we are among the best in the world, not the biggest. We're a small company, and mm -hmm. we intend to remain that way. Um, so the customer has to trust us. You came to me because you like my work. Let me do my work. Hmm. It's, it's a bit arrogant, but it's... Yeah, it's a filter. We're adamant, yeah. Do we have time? Uh, in our shop, we don't work overtime. Uh, family's too important. Life is too important. You know, and, and I think 40 hours of work is, is plenty. Mm -hmm. And same with my staff. They have lives. Uh, you know, we, we have a, a pretty good system. We, we want everyone to have their lives are important too. So we don't, you know, if a, if a job is due, in, and I say it's due in eight weeks, I can do it in five. Mm -hmm. Because something's going to go wrong. Something's going to go haywire. Uh, something's going to, we're going to get a better idea, you know. Right. It's all got to be priced in at the front so that we can come out the back hmm. and, and do okay. So, so do we have time? I mean, we're, right now we're booked until April. So if you come to me and you need a job in two weeks, uh, you just gave me a no. Yeah. I'm sorry, I'll give you a name of somebody if I can. <laughs> Chances mm -hmm. are I can't. But, um, mm -hmm. or, or take a number. Hmm. And it takes a deposit to get on my list. Hmm. You know, like if you, if you want to book... In, in May now, you've got to put a deposit now to book that time. 
Hmm. And number six, I noticed will we make money was Hor not the first criteria. The, hor the horse is before the cart. Okay. Or is the other <laughs> way around. But um, is, it's not my first question. Because most people, that's the first question. Will we make money? Yeah. Yes, take the job. And in the process, the customer's driving them instead of them driving mm -hmm. the business. So, so that's the last question we ask. So looking at these six, which one have you eliminated? Uh, the first two have been combined because they're almost okay. the same. Got it. Got it. So does it I excite never, us? I can never remember the six ones, so we just... And will it be fun? I can see yeah. that. I'll let you slide on that. Yeah. Five, okay. five fits a handful. Five, of... That's what we're down to now. Perfect. This, right. this comes from my TED Talk. That's where... Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Dan and I both spoke at the inaugural TEDx Chilliwack in 2016. That was challenging. His talk was much better than mine. and, and uh, I, I, <laughs> I, I think you got a standing ovation. Fair enough. <laughs> I don't know that well, I did. Well, the chairs were so uncomfortable <laughs> they had to get up. So. I was the last speaker. I think everybody just wanted to go home at that That's point. That's true. Anyways, so I want to talk about inspiration because clearly there is so many things that are, are so different about your work and you're constantly on the lookout. Tell me about this. So this is in your studio. I think if, if you want to be a creative person, you have to plug your head full of ideas. And it doesn't mean you copy what you see, but if you can provide 50 different ways to do something, and then you can take a little bit here and a little bit here and a little bit here, you're creating something that will pass original. Mm -hmm. We'll put it that way. Um, and, and I imagine early on, your work was probably a little bit more derivative than original, could you say? Is uh, your... You could certainly tell who I was influenced by. Okay. Um, Speaking of influences, did, were you ever tried to be recruited by some of the big guys at all? Uh, Disney chased me for a while. I, okay. I was privileged to have a tour of Imagineering, and it was facilitated by uh, Vice President Tony Baxter, a real nice guy. And he took me out in his balcony, and there's like a thousand guys working there. Hmm. The most creative team in the world, without a doubt. Hmm. And, and he looked, and he says, any desk is yours. And I, I declined him. I was probably one of the few guys in the world that um, didn't want to work in Imagineering. I would love to work there for a season, hmm. you know, maybe four weeks, just right. enough to grab Take all the good stuff. Take enough pictures. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> but I don't think I could fit in that corporate thing. Yeah. And... And so he actually, every time I was down that area, I'd bump into somebody that knew him and say, Tony still wants you. So thank you, but no thank you. Hmm. So, so books are important. Yeah. Uh, this is us doing research at Splash Mountain. Yeah, you do field trips every year, don't you? Uh, business expense. Okay. Uh, and I always, like my granddaughter Phoebe is there, my daughter's there, because if I can look at a park, she will see things that I don't because... She's a different person and, yeah, and a, a younger, different perspective and different age. She yeah. was 11 then. And so we get to write that off too. And, and I listen carefully. What is she like? What is not like? What, is, what appeals to her? What's exciting? What's not? You know, because something I think is really cool, she'd go, you know. Have you found that your ability to do thrill rides has gone down as you've aged at all? Or are you still like on the edge of your seat? Uh, I, w I, I mean, if, I wouldn't go do the elevator at, at Okay. That, 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 if it has a story to it, Disney does it well. And right. They, they're called family rides. Yeah. Uh, no, there's nothing there I won't go on. Speaking Ten of times. not family ride, we went on a family vacation this year to New York, and, and a destination my son wanted to go to was um, Coney Island, and Coney they Island. have the original Cyclone uh, wooden bone, roller coaster. Bone shaker. Yeah, that, that did me in, I tell you. You're a I wuss. knew that I was beyond, <laughs> be, beyond a certain age. <laughs> no, I would go on it in a yeah. flash. Yeah. yeah, I went on it once. That was fine. Once would probably be enough. Yeah. Even at um, Cultus Lake, the, um, what's the one that does the loop? Loop? Yeah, we went on that. I mean, they put it, put it together, yeah. and then they, no one's ever ridden on it. <laughs> I did that the one twice, and, and then... The, and the, he's, the, the guy who's going to certify it says, go ahead, and he puts us on it and does, yep, it's good. Yeah, and my kids, both, I think, at 12 or 13 years old, they did it like 20 times Have you been row. on it? Yeah, enough. I'm good. I'm, I'm good. I'm good, I'm too. out. I'm yeah. good. Yeah, fair enough. Sorry, back to the program. <laughs> <laughs> so personal projects. So many of these things, you've commercialized, they've become portfolio pieces, they're your calling cards, and you've really taken that to heart. What a grandpa would do this. Like, this is Every amazing. grandpa should have an electric train. Yeah. Okay? Mine's just big. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, anyone that wants a train in the yard is crazy. Like, certifiably crazy. Or they have too much money. And I, I'm not crazy. I'm good. 
But and you have I, too much money? But I don't have too much <laughs> okay, money. Fair enough. But, but I mean, in that case, and, it, and I think it's, an, it's a lesson for all of us, is I went down to a, a local uh, fabrication shop and went through a scrap bin and got three pieces of steel. Hmm. And he said 20 bucks. So I can afford 20 bucks. I have time to weld three pieces of steel. And you do that over a course of years, right. and I have a railroad around my yard. Hmm. I'm the coolest grandpa in the world. No kidding. Yeah. That's only one of them, one of the toys. So that's the personal project in your realm. For any grandpa, that's a huge one. Well, but part of I wanted to sell theme park trains, too. Right. So, and I have. So tell me about this harebrained scheme, the Hazelnut Inn. This is... Not harebrained, but... No but harebrained. Big, okay, no, crazy. Fair enough. Crazy. Fair enough. <laughs> this proves that it's, what I have is genetically passed on. Mm-hmm. This is actually my son's project, uh, Peter. Peter and Haley got married six years ago. Uh, on their honeymoon, they want to stay in a, in a castle. I mean, who wouldn't? You know, they grew up in theme parks and stuff. They had to go to Europe. And on the plane ride home, it's like, why isn't that here? Hmm. That's how it was born. And then the castle morphed into bigger stuff. It was sort of as a and b and it, you know, then, then they went to, a year later, they went to um, Lord of the Rings, that okay. movie set, yeah, yeah. Hobbiton. Right. And again, you, you open the door, and it's this deep. Hmm. You can't stay there. And I went, why not? Okay, we can build that. And then we get to add a third one, and that became the Explorer Suite or, or the hmm. North Star. So. so this is actually a scale model. I saw it on your, your desk last week. It's about this big. It's four feet long. That's where we solved all the problems. How do, right. you, how do you fit all that in? Because you needed to go to the city of Chilliwack and, and plunk it down on the Here's planning table. Here's what I want a building permit for. And they go, oh, sure. Here yeah. you go. Yeah. No. <laughs> it, it, $100,000 of engineering solved all that stuff. Wow. So, because it's, there's, I mean, even the fire department came and did a tour through a couple weeks ago, it, not for an official inspection, but they said, we want to see what, what kind of challenges we could possibly face in the future. And what they found is it's, it's suspended slabs, it's concrete, it's walls, it's steel, it's wood. So basically every possibly uh, different kind, that's not my phone, any, any possible way of constructing, we've incorporated in that building. So hmm. it's... You know, it's a tough challenge. And it's going to take probably four years to pull off. But this is, again, we think it's a viable business. It's c- catering to, to newlyweds and um, anniversary couples or special occasion. Uh, we're adamant it's going to be. And who wouldn't want to stay in Disneyland? I, by the way, that was the perfect um, ringtone to go along with city inspection. Yes. Like, just, just, like just, like, <laughs> <laughs> just like, dun, dun, dun. Yeah. yeah. They love coming to see it. It's cool. Hmm. And... And our engineers love it. It's a very, very challenging project. Hmm. So Peter, this is actually Peter and Haley's project, and this is what we use to fill in the gaps between our projects. So and again, there's no critical timeline. This is a people. This ever is a, how much is going to cost? And what is it going to? What is it? How long is it going to take? I couldn't tell you. <laughs> it's going to take what it's going to take, and it's going to be finished when it's finished. So the resident CFO Janice, how's she feeling about the Hazelnut Inn? She loves it. Yeah, it's fitting yeah. the budget and. Yeah, I mean, it fits in the neighborhood. Yeah. Our house is sort of like sure. that, too. So it's, this is, there's three suites there, and, and it's, uh, you're going to have to see it to, to believe it. It's, yeah. it, it's the, on the scale of stupid, it's way <laughs> up there. It's, but it, but it, in the end, it's Disney quality on a small scale. Hmm. And this time, you can stay in it. Um, mm-hmm. Each suite is 600 square feet, 600 square foot private garden, hot tub, fireplace in and out. Um, it's wow. It's luxury at its best with a story. And to end, uh, I want to talk about some lessons learned. You touched on a little bit, but oh, you called been these a, guys the dream team. The dream team. This is our Edmonton team. We're not even the full team. That was, I think, 14 or 15, and we went up to 22. Hmm. Uh, we hire uh, kids right out of school. Uh, I'm looking for cr- creative people, but more importantly, kids with a dream. And I make a simple deal. Is, is you help me, I'll help you. Hmm. It's, it's a two-way street. And so these kids have gone on to be doctors and lawyers and um, all kinds of crazy things. Whatever their dream was, their dream job, hmm. I said, don't settle for less. In the meantime, come make money. And hmm. we had so much fun. But I learned as our team expanded, my job changed until that point where we were doing three jobs in three cities and I was driving between them. Yeah. And I think somewhere between here and Banff, I went, this is stupid. This is not what I want to do. Uh, because mm-hmm. I wasn't welding and grinding and, and 
sculpting and doing all the stuff I loved. Mm -hmm. I was managing people. And they were still doing fabulous work. Mm -hmm. And so I sat everybody down and said, I've made a horrible mistake. Uh, we're going to purposely downsize our company back down to seven people. So you know that dream you told me about when you started? Let's make that happen. Hmm. And over the next year, year and a half, we, most of them went away and, yeah. and onto their dream. And I think this picture is the perfect one to end on. It absolutely is. Is is as entrepreneurs, we get so wrapped up in our businesses. It, it takes so much energy, and the most important thing in life is our family. I mean, and in our case, my daughter lives on property, my son lives on property, and Janice and I live on property. And family is what it's about. This is my grandson Henry, the youngest, and his favorite thing is I want to go to work, hmm. go to work with Grandpa. Uh, he he's and and they work with me from that age. And I, even now, when Peter gets a little bit frustrated because Henry's helping, I said, it only takes a little longer. But think, if I had invested that time when you were that age, you wouldn't be working with me now. Hmm. And Peter's now my boss. Peter and Haley own a company, which, is, which proves that, you know, you start out sweeping the floor and eventually you own a company. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, in Haley's case, it was only three years. So mm -hmm. you work hard and you can get ahead. So. Mm -hmm. Well, fantastic. Let's hear it for Dan. Great. Thank you.